So, hey, congratulations on your uh, 2022 Inland Championship inaugural Melgus 15 event. How does it feel to be number one? Feels good. Um, yeah, it was super fun. You know, yeah. Great time. Good. So, hey, can you tell us a little bit about your background and about yourself so we know who we're talking to? Um, I grew up in, in Lake Country. I started sailing um, on North Lake when I was like five, did Opti's X boats, and then um, high school sailing too. And then after X boats, sailed Melga 17s for a little bit, um, and then sailed at Madison in college. Um, so it was just down in nationals in, um, in June, in May, in May. Um, and were then you at, in uh, college, were you in four seventies or what were you in? Four twenties, four twenties. Okay. Yeah. So basically a Melgus 15 kind of right. so very similar. Yeah. Very, very similar. Yeah. And then recently got into the e-boat too. Um, last year was my first year sailing e-boats and then this year too. So, yeah. And where do you prefer to be on the e-boat? Uh, drive. I, I prefer to drive. Okay. I could it for, for like half a season um, and then got my own boat, just started driving. Uh, very nice. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, what attracted you to try the Melgus 15? Um, basically, I just graduated college and um, I really love dinghy sailing. Yeah. Boy 20s, FJs. It's like what I love. Um, yeah. And it's like a little bit more exciting for 20. So with a kite um, and yeah, super fun, big roll tax, big roll jibes. Yeah. You know, a lot of hiking and uh yeah what would you say the biggest because a lot of the people who come into the 15 are probably just like yourself coming from those other boats what would you say the biggest learning you had to have to to transition to the 15 what's different um what's different is the chine so um you you want a little bit more heel in light air and chop I mean, you still carry heel and like 420s and FJs in, in chop, right. but um, you do want a little bit of that heel, just, you know, get more surface out of the water and it's like more bite, more lateral bite. Mm -hmm. And, um, but something really similar to the 420 and the FJ is you want to get your weight like as far forward as possible, um, especially upwind. Like, like if there's chop, you should be as far forward as like your nose diving into every wave and then just take that a step back and just so you're you're at the front edge of your skipper position right where do you put your crew um right next to you as as far forward as possible okay um the pitching doesn't really do anything unless you're like huge huge swell in chop you want a stable boat and you want to have that bow down okay um, yeah all right uh what did, what did you find was the most challenging about the Melgus 15? Definitely um, light air, light to medium air downwinds for sure. Like the in-between where you can plane sometimes, but uh, not very often. Yeah. Um, that was by far like the hardest, I think for, I think it's the hardest for everyone though. So like we, we like were figuring it out, it out more and more over the weekend, but um. Yeah, that's by far the hardest part of the boat. Right. And how did you make the decision? How, how did you make the call about whether you were going to go for plane or just let it? So um, we'd. Uh, it's kind of a feel thing. I hate to say that, but um, like you feel the boat load up. And like if you see a shot coming and you're like in a, a lighter spot, so you're in your like soaking mode, like your low mode, weight really far forwards. Like we have our crew in front of um in front of the shrouds, um, sitting like up by the jib, kind of. Wow. And um, Damn. yeah, yeah, like <laughs> bow in the water, transom as far out as possible. Did you have uh, a? Do you have one leg in front of the skipper position, or were you 
right mid vote no uh i i just sit kind of butt in front uh knees facing backwards but um but when when we'd see the pressure coming over our shoulder we're in that low mode um we'd heat up i'd trim in the main a little bit let the boat press and like heel and then i'd hop to windward and like flatten mm -hmm. and then we'd scoot back and try to like pop it up on a plane in those and we'd also do that um in in the to try to surf too okay. um in the light stuff where you're not fully planning but you can surf we right. we do that same like skipper hop to windward to press it down after you like load the boat up right have um, you sailed it in a bigger breeze yet yeah so we did a little bit of practice before the event but i mean probably five hours in total okay but just like an hour every day well an hour a couple times a week like a couple days a week um for a couple weeks right and we sailed in everything from like four to you know 18 right which was pretty good for us and um yeah and the big breeze just yeah it it riffs but you have to just scoot way back yeah. especially in waves yeah. so you're not um hitting the next one and like driving and pumping through it right kinda. yeah some wave action so uh um, you didn't get a chance to really experience that there i think this time yeah not much but there was it was like 15 16 in the beginning of the saturday so it was like planning like the yeah. entire downwind um and that was fun but there, there was enough chop that you had to drive through it right where like if you stuff it you'll just pop drop off your plane yeah. and you just every time you drop off the plane it's like so slow like right. you boat lengths so right. yeah and were you able to do blow through drives or were you doing anything like that in your downwind runs uh so so basically the way we would do it is um if we're planning it's blow throughs um so i'd call a skiffy and then we'd turn through it and like turn really quick try to try to get planning as soon as possible but anytime we weren't planning going into the jibe, it was always like J70 style, mm -hmm. like pre-trims, big roll, mm -hmm. big flatten, like kinetic jibes. Right. So, so it's like transitioning like from one to the other and like having that call and like knowing like you have those two options and um, yeah. Now, how do, how do you manage crew communication in that case? You said you call a skiffy. So you have uh, terms for the different types of things you might execute that you yeah, practice yeah. with your crew? Yeah, yeah. So we practiced in like both conditions, you know, yeah. really windy and and really light. So we practiced both. Um, this was by far the most sailing we we had done in the boat this weekend in total. But um, just knowing that if it's going to be like just calling a skiffy, it's like so huge and like calling it like 15 seconds before it's going to happen. Right. Like, like as long as you're not around other boats, like you should have your game plan out and like everybody should know like what's going to happen, like way before it's going to happen. Right. Um, right. Yeah, you can't be thinking about or explaining it to each other in the process. No, no, it has to be like well thought out. And like the same thing goes for, uh, for drops too, mm -hmm. like like uh, I'll probably call the turn and the drop halfway down the leg. Okay. Um, like like the, there's the game plan is there, so like it might change, but right. like you should always like be thinking about like what you know like how you're gonna come into this gate. Like if you're crowded, like you might wanna you know try to get to course right. So you're coming in on starboard, stuff yeah. like that, just like thinking ahead. Yeah. And the communication too. So yeah. What yeah. can you tell me about your control changes? You had a lot, you were talking about how the wind was kind of up and down, and sometimes you could play and sometimes you couldn't. Upwind, let's talk about upwind a little bit. You know, G Nav, Cunningham, Outhaul, describe what you had to go through in this series. Um I think basically 
just like the 420, like you don't really change the outhaul. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount you do, you would change it is so small. You want from like three inches to one and a half inches, like between the boom and the foot in the middle. So you kind of just leave it at that. Like the depth low is not bad. Um, you know, it's not much moment on the, on the sale. So like, it's not that bad. And, um, but for the Vang, um, when we, they, when we were like fully hiked and like overpowered, like we just pull it on till, you know, like, and Vang sheet and mm -hmm. just like hike really, really hard basically. And then in the, in the moderate stuff is, is where it kind of came. Like we were trying to, we tried some different things with it where like, it was kind of choppy and like, sometimes it would feel a little draggy because mm -hmm. like the boat was going kind of slow. So sometimes we'd pull on some Vang and like point lower mm -hmm. to take some drag out of the boat. But I mean, like, yeah, pl definitely playing the Vang uh, for like, for like different pressure, like, you know, but never, never too much. You, if you pull on too much, it's, it's like the sail like goes really bad and it's, it's just not good. Did you do the GNAV uh, control or did your crew? Crew, crew. The okay. skipper should not be doing that. You need to be driving and sheeting and your, your crew does small changes, but just like in college, like the crew is always on the bang. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, I don't think the skipper should ever touch that. May, sometimes I will say sometimes I'll pop it off. Like, like we'll pop it on the sets or like on the windward mark roundings. It'll pop when we turn around the windward mark to the offset. And then once the kite is up, I'll like look at it and like do fine tune adjustments. Mm -hmm. But that's the only time I would ever touch it. Right. What about downhaul, Cunningham? Uh, oh, big, big, super important. Um, if you're overpowered, it just makes your life easier. Um, just pulling that draft forwards, like it just makes you have to sheet like way less. Yeah. And it's way, because like, it'll, it'll like stall, like it'll depower the front of the sail way quicker. You'll, you the boom has to travel less of an angle. Mm -hmm. for the sail to start like luffing kind of right so like pulling that draft as far forward it just like you're sheeting half as much sheet to get the same effect out of your vang sheeting so yep. you need that on and it, it gives you more forward drive too in the in the heavy air yeah more efficient uh less pointing but more like fast forward boat speed right so like crank on that and if it's like nuking nuking like you can banjo it on mm -hmm. so like pull slack out pull right like as tight as possible well so let's talk about rig tension because that also relates to um you know going through chop or you know whatever do you know what you had your rig tension set for yeah we started at um we we were we were like 300 pounds mm -hmm. um not like on the rig but like just weight crew weight mm -hmm. and we started at uh 19 or 18 and a half and it was blowing in in the beginning of the saturday so it was like the breeze was up right it was like 15 um but i mean it'll change like that'll change based on your weight like what you're on like what your rig is set up for is like based on what your weight is and how much bang you're pulling on is basically what it comes down to. Like the more you're banging, the more rig tension you need. Yeah. Because at full bang, you shouldn't have your uh, your force day collapsing or like breaking kind of. Because that's like, yeah, it just supports the bang basically. And then the less bang you have, the less rig tension you want. So uh, it was shifty on Winnebago. Did you see any particular wind patterns? <clears throat> what were you watching for? Uh, so the way the course was set, um, the shoreline on was it was like a south, um, south south 
west kind of both days a little bit there were some like changes but that was like the main direction and like just shoreline effects okay. like righties on the right side like more pressure um mm -hmm. and and yeah but it was like the main thing is just finding your lane like mm -hmm. to sail to where you want to be like you need your lane and if you don't have your lane tacking is not slow like just tack and then tack tack like yeah. And on the start too, like stay out of trouble. Just get off every single time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Dellenbaugh says strategy is your plan you have before your race for how you're going to execute the race and tactics or what you do when somebody else gets in your way. Yeah. How, how exactly? <laughs> how often were you able to stay on strategy versus uh, playing tactics? Um. For the most part, it was strategy and speed. We would just. Well, we would, there were some like tactical modings, like off the start, like we wouldn't pull Van on very hard and I'd trim really hard and just hike and tr just try to like, right. we'd always start to lure to the boat, basically of the boat, like clump. Right. So we just try to pinch off as many of the boats until they all started going. And then we just flop with them yeah. basically every single race. And it was, it was pretty bulletproof. Um, do you have a preferred starting strategy? Are you a port end starter? Are you a port tack starter and find a hole? Are you a starboard end? What do you? Uh, I love a good port approach. Yeah. Um, especially for that to lured of the clump, kind of like out just out of the chaos, but close enough to where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get it off every time. Yeah. So I think for the most part, we'd cycle and then we'd go back at like 145 or something and then tack into place at like, like 105 usually. And then just hold, like we, we just go like really slow for the first like 40 seconds of our, of our spot. Right. And then in the last 20, we'd get our speed going and then just point as high as we can and have like our sails like pulling and just like going really, really high. Right. And closing the gap. Cause like I would try to have no hole at, for most of the minute and then just make my hole um, by like either accelerating and then like shooting. So like hiking really hard and like rolling to windward and shooting right. up to just get your hole when you need it basically. Yeah, because my experience in this fleet is that they can close a gap pretty quickly if you're not careful. So you, what you do is you delay that that time when you create your hole until it's quick enough that somebody can't really get in there. Yeah. So like, like just eyes behind, you know, because people are going to be coming from behind because the boat ends were always super super packed and right. people are always like late at the boat. Um. So they are always coming through trying to get it so you just make it really unappealing right. but sideways like until you're into your like like okay we're gonna get our speed back and we're gonna like focus and try to get up as close to the boat to windward as we can right now right so are you using any uh race computer no old you're school a, you're a butt on butt on the hull field yeah. guy compass no yeah. no numbers yeah i'm sure it's nice i've never sailed with it in my life talk to me about line sites do you use line sites how do you make how do you tell your distance you don't you're not using any equipment of course we can't in the 15 we can't use it for line uh distance how are you checking your distance to the line um basically just look over one shoulder and then look at the yeah. pin end and just like mentally draw a line. Yeah. But I mean, there's a big line sack. So, yeah. so you, you can know that the closer to the middle you start and then you can keep your bow there yeah. and then just like accelerate earlier and then turn up at like, turn up and start sailing up when a little earlier because you're like, all right, I'm like four boat lengths below the line. We can start sailing at like 15 seconds. Right. And nobody else around us knows this. So like you could do stuff like that, but for the most part, we were close enough to an end 
like close enough. We weren't like at it, but we were close enough. So it wasn't too difficult. Right. Um, um, so what would you say about the tacking angles with a 15 similar to the 420? What about versus an ESCO? Um, definitely, definitely. Um, they, yeah, they were pretty similar to a 420, I would say. I think a little wider than an E for sure. Um, but you have so many modes upwind to play with that um, like they, they swing a lot. So if you're in your high mode, like high and slow, yep. you, you have like set like six or seven degrees to play with that the VMG is really equal. Yeah. But you basically just go into your mode to like, like there's pressure over the shoulder. We're going to high mode because as long as we stay in this, we're going to gain so much more. Right. Or we're going like low mode out to the side because I know there's the shift here. Right. And we're just trying to get there first. Yeah. Um, and so the tacking angles can change and you can, but, but it's pretty wide. It's pretty, it's like a 420. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, so I heard a story. I unfortunately wasn't there to see it, but I heard your crew fell out of the boat right before the finish. <laughs> Tell me this story. Yeah. Well, basically we were, it was uh, uh, sometime on the first day, I think it was race two maybe um we had just we were right sailing right next to uh graham ness like the whole downwind like we were just like just trying to get this one position basically uh, both of us so just down to the finish line like we're both like bow even and we're just shooting down to the line uh, and and i i don't think the i don't we'll we've never done a downwind like shoot like that right so I don't think the communication was very, uh, very good on my end of what was about to happen. Uh, so, so it was, yeah, it was a big turn down and she took a tumble, but uh, yeah. But she hung on with the uh, hands of steel, apparently. Yeah. To the kite sheets. It's like, oh, she's got her back in the boat. <laughs> Did you get her back in before you finished or after you finished? I don't even know. I don't even know when we finished in there. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. I, I I think it would be awesome if somebody caught a photo of that. Yeah, or a video. Even yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't gonna let us let us lose. You know, that's classic. Yeah. Well, wow, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you out on the race course. Are you gonna do any of the winter or the uh, upcoming events down south, Jensen, um, for example? I think that might be the plan to yeah. do like the, the circuit. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's a little way off. We'll see. Yeah. But hopefully. Yeah. yeah. It'd be nice to see you down there. I'll be sailing all three of those and it'll oh. be fun to see you in person. Yeah. You too. You too. All right, Jonathan, congratulations, man. Great do. And it's the, the, the first, you're the number one Malgus 15 sailor in the inlands this year in the first inland ever that's nobody can take that away yeah thanks yeah awesome. yeah all right well thank you for talking with sales and we'll talk again soon yeah of course